Hello and welcome. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to Westminster Presbyterian Church. It's an important discussion that we're having tonight, increasing availability of affordable and multifamily housing and overcoming segregation. Our first speaker, Reverend Eric Dobson, is Deputy Director of the Fair Share Housing Center in New Jersey. He assists the Executive Director in all aspects of the Center's daily operations and strategic planning. Eric focuses on development, advocacy, and communication. He uses policy and coalition building to bring about racial, economic, and social integration. Eric is an ordained minister and holds a BA from Temple University. He has extensive experience building diverse audiences, communities, and specializes in interfaith outreach. Eric is the co-founder of Open Communities, LLC, a racial integration consulting firm that works to resolve conflicts of race, ethnicity, and socioeconomics. Eric also founded Planting Seeds of Hope, a nonprofit focused youth development and education. I'm sorry, nonprofit focused on youth development and education. In addition, Eric served as the Pennsylvania Clergy Outreach Director for Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign. So please join me in a warm welcome for Reverend Eric Dobson. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. It's always crazy to listen to your bio, like mm -hmm. to show you how um, humbled I am to even listen to stuff like that. I get really skittish about it because I'm just a human being just like anybody else. I know we have to do that as a formality, but um, I'm a kid from North Philadelphia who grew up in the inner city of Philadelphia, moved to New Jersey, got involved in the pastoring in Philadelphia and in New Jersey. Um, and really found my space, my calling, if you would say, keep it spiritual, so we're in the church. Several, um, many years into my ministry, uh, I met a woman who was feeding the homeless for Dr. King's birthday. You know, we do all service days for Dr. King, um, service day, day of service. I'm not quite sure he would agree with that um, if he was still alive. I think he would be more focused on policy instead of doing service days. But anyway. I was feeding the homeless downtown Philadelphia, Center City, and I was like, this is great. Looking forward to doing this next year. And she looked at me, next year, we do this every week. And at that moment, I had a decision to make. What is my ministry? Being in the church, speaking, or being out there feeding the homeless, rain, sleet, snow, shine every day for the next 10 years. And she would say, you're a pastor, you're a reverend, speak to the homeless. My best sermons was in two minutes outside in the streets of Philadelphia, talking to homeless people, ministering to them. And then that, that, those 10 years really showed me my calling is not just in the pulpit, but my calling is really changing policy. 90% of our lives are affected by policy. Unfortunately, not enough Americans know that. What happens at the legislator level, policy-making level, impacts the everyday lives of Americans, and many don't even know that. So at Fairshire Housing Center, I, I was brought on to really organize. I was known as organizing clergy. I'm a part of New Jersey Coalition of Religious Leaders. My religion is integration, racial, economic, social, and religious integration. That's what I believe in. That's what we brought here at Fairshire Housing Center. And I'll get to like the history of how we got to, to here where we are today because it's important, history is important. So let me try to talk about our agenda for a moment. The history of housing in America. I can't talk about what we've done in New Jersey without talking about what has happened nationally in the history of, how did we get here? How did segregation happen, right? And we're talking about Mount Laurel today, where we are, other barriers and access in the future of housing in New Jersey, and have some discussion questions. I would preference this by saying many of the images that I'm going to show in this PowerPoint, PowerPoint is very graphic, very graphic images. And why? It's our history in this country. 
Many of us try to choose to ignore that, gloss over it, don't want to look at it, but says a lot about who we are as a country and as our society. How did we get to being a segregated community? Well, it took a lot of violence to get there, right? So let me go back. What is an American? That's the first question I always ask when I do these presentations, because we don't think about that too often. What is an American? What is it? What does it mean to be an American? Pledge allegiance to the flag? Know the Constitution? I'll tell you what it means to be an American. Because we're all our victims of it. We're all just consumers of Americanism. For instance, let me tell you, like, when we talk about affordable housing, this always gets very controversial, right? We always, affordable housing, anybody, who, who, who owns a home? Who has a mortgage? And so when we talk about affordable housing and subsidies, everybody in here who owned a home, whoever, whoever has owned a home or still owned a home, guess what? You live in affordable housing. Every last one of you. Your home, your mortgage is subsidized. Think about it. So when we had these fights and debates about who's moving in and what, what subsidized housing look like, we all live in subsidized housing. As Dr. King says, the rich get socialism, the poor get capitalism. Subsidies and entitlements are just phrased, different phrases to keep us divided, right? That's the whole purpose of what America has done when it comes to creating the illusion and the myth of race. There's no biological sniff against the race. It's all an illusion to keep us divided, right? As James Baldwin said many years ago, there's not a white person in America who can prove that they're white. When most of your ancestors came here, my ancestors, well, your ancestors, when they came here, those who were of the Caucasian race, you were French, you were Dutch, you were German. You guys, <laughs> it's so funny, because I, when I think about this, right, I was on, and I'm going to get to my presentation, I'm going to hurry up. I was on a Zoom meeting, right, and they asked us before the Zoom meeting, oh, if you could speak a second language, what would it be? And everybody went around, oh, it would be French, it would be Spanish, it would be Italian. And they said, Eric, what would yours be? I said, oh, it would be my native language, but I don't know what that is. So I went home, thought about that, feeling sorry for myself, and then the light bulb went on. Boom! white Americans can speak more than one language? How many white Americans can speak their native language? Show of hands. How many of you can speak your native language? One. You see what America does to you? You have no sense of who you are. That's what an American assimilation does strip you of who you are, and produce something else, consumer of racism, sexism, religious, all the isms that exist. That's what we become. So we talk about affordable housing, we put people in categories. So how did that all start? Well, we got to talk about the history of this country. My ancestors came over here, not because they were cheerful in coming over here. They were brought over here by human chattel, right? against their will. And Baldwin always said this too, like, <laughs> it's so funny. Like, your ancestors came over here, not, they wouldn't have come here if they were doing well where they were. Right? So, the popularity, the wealth, the prosperity of the entire globe was because of slavery. Not just American wealth, not just the Southern wealth, but the, the, the British Empire. All wealth created through slavery, right? Free labor, right? And this is some of the, some of the signs that public sale of slaves. Monday, November 16, 1663, three Negro men, one Negro woman and a small child. So why do I show these pictures? Why? Because we don't like to remember our history. So if we don't know where we come from, how do we know where we're going? If we don't know how to talk about affordable housing in context, then we get into these 
minuscule arguments about entitlements. It's all smoke and mirrors, right? Brutal, brutal times. This is not some foreign field. This is America. We're in the first state. The first state. You know, it's so funny. When we talk about violence, right? When we talk about how do we get here? Anybody ever read the Declaration of Independence? Yeah, have you? I encourage you to go back and read that document. I was stunned when I read that document because I thought it was this elaborate document about, you know, all about images of America being great. I know I'm in a church, so I'm trying to temper my language. But it, the Declaration of Independence is a screw you England. That's what it was. <laughs> if you read it and really look at it, I'm like, holy crap. They was like, screw you. We're not taking this anymore. So 13 little colonies took on the British Empire. So we want to know where, you know, how we categorize, you know, black people as violent. No. The 13 colonies created violence in this country through their independence. Give me, remember this? We all learned this as a kid. Give me liberty or give me death, right? You guys remember that? That's the foundation of our country. So slavery, the violence that happened on slavery, hold on, hold on, clicker. Oh, I got the, there you go. Let me go back, let me go back, let me go back. Because this is important, this is important. Let me get closer to The Revolutionary War, I'm sorry, the Revolutionary War then, first of all, the Revolutionary War, there's, there's not a war in this country that blacks didn't fight in. So when we talk about, you know, you hear people talking about, wow, go back to where you came from. We fought in every war. The War of Independence, black people fought in that war. Do you realize that? The race war, you guys know what the race war was? The Civil War. First person killed was a black man, right? The American Patriots, these were black soldiers fighting on both sides. And why am I telling you this? Because history is important. Housing has been the catalyst for how we created the white middle class in this country. So you need to understand how did that happen, right? So we have the Revolutionary War, the Civil War. These are black soldiers fighting the Civil War. Gaining independence. The one time, there was only two times in the history of this country that we ever tried integration. Only two times in the history of this country we ever tried it. So when we talk about integration, people say, oh, it didn't work, or we never tried it. We only tried it for a small period of time. One was Reconstruction. And doggone it, it was working. <laughs> Wouldn't you know, it was working. You take people who are slaves, give them nothing, absolutely nothing, but an opportunity, not only did they start to create wealth and building and having land and building houses, they were elected the first color senators represented during the Reconstruction. So the myth about, you know, the work habits of black and brown folks is a myth, right? Our ancestors worked for free, free 400 years. All, all that we ever wanted was opportunity. Still to this day, not a handout, not pity, opportunity, right? The one thing that this country always does, and Ibram X. Kendi says this, if you ever heard Ibram X. Kendi's a book, How to Be Anti-Racist, you ever read that book? If you have not read that book, I highly recommend it. He said, when all of there was, whenever there is racial progress, there are always racist progress. 
So the backlash of Reconstruction, violence. This is a graphic image. But all, don't look at the folks who are hanging on the tree. Look at the folks who are looking at the bottom. This is America. Not long ago. Not long ago. Black Wall Street. Eric, what does this have to do with housing? It has everything to do with housing. Everything to do with housing. Because the middle class was created through a home ownership. Property that black, businesses that black people own. Violence backlash when blacks are progressing or when you talk about affordable housing, what happens? Violent backlash, right? Then we move into really trying to get into integration. Striking images. Monday is my 55th birthday. Monday, this coming Monday. I was born, I always say this, like 1868, the 14th, 15th Amendment really ratified. 100 years later, 1968, Dr. King was assassinated and I was born. This crazy thing that the history talks about this is like, it's so ironic. And we'll get to this. This is, this is when we talk about NIMBYism, the backlash for affordable housing, the backlash toward uh, housing laws. This is, this is not, this is 50 years ago. Violence, this is, this is how we got to where we are, right? Racial redlining. Anybody ever heard of redlining? Yes, this is when the civil rights movement happened and it was illegal to be racist because up until then, it was legal to be racist. And, and, and hear me out, I'm not talking about individual racism. I'm talking about policy, federal government policy. How did we get here? Federal policy, it was legal to be racist. So the banks were, put the, the areas where the black and brown folks put them in red, cold them in red, where they wouldn't get mortgages. And all the other places that would get mortgages. And this is what Dr. King fought, of, fought about, talked about. Everybody loves, well some people, talks about the I have a dream speech. <laughs> Great speech. Greed beyond Vietnam. We love to have Dr. King, the, 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 and this, the holiday is coming up, service day. They want to talk about Dr. King a few years before he was assassinated. Radical views. Changing our whole economic system. Because we refuse to do what we need to do as a country. Anybody ever read that speech, Beyond Vietnam? You should read that. You know when he gave that speech? April 4th, 1967, Dr. King gave that speech. April 4th, 1967. Do anybody know when Dr. King was assassinated? Anybody? April 4th, 1968, one year later. The exact same day. How ironic is that? And here we have it. Whenever there is racial progress, there's racist backlash. Because of the assassination of Dr. King, this is controversial what I'm about to say. Now, you may say, well, how much more controversial can you have with the images you've shown? Probably the greatest president that this nation have ever seen when it comes to civil rights. Now, I know what you're thinking. The Vietnam War. Yes, devastating. Civil rights policy, civil rights legislation would not have happened without this man signing that bill. Now you say, well, he had to sign it. No, he did not. Matter of fact, the Democrats wanted no part of the bill. 
Many of them opposed the bill. Guess what this guy had to do? He had to work with the Republicans to get the civil rights legislation passed. Did you all know that? Did, did anybody know that? Yeah. The Democratic president had to go across the aisle to get civil rights legislation passed because there were some Democrats, what Malcolm would call Dixiecrats, Southern Democrats posing as Democrats, but they really were racist. And Malcolm would say, you know, we talk about the South. We harp on the South. Anything below Canada is the South. That's what <laughs> If you look at the legislation that he signed in the Great Society Initiative, which all of us are still benefiting from today. Anybody know about the Great Society Initiative? Anybody ever heard of First Start, Head Start? Anybody ever heard of Medicare, Medicaid? Anybody ever heard of that? Volunteer, Vista Corps? It's Johnson. That was Johnson. Did you all know that? That was Johnson. This is a statement that's so profound. Yeah, we, we, you know, I, 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 you know, the contradiction of him being from Texas and his positions before he got into power. Yes, yeah, it's very controversial. But he says something that really struck with me. He said, if you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him somebody to look down on, and he'll empty his pockets for you. How true is that? Still today. Still today, that is so true today that we actually had, several years ago, people storming the Capitol. I don't care about your politics. Did you ever imagine that you would witness what you witnessed on January 6th? Anybody, anybody, in America. This is true. Why am I talking about this? History matters. Race for profit. Princeton professor Kiyanga Yamada Teller, how the banks in the real estate industry undermine black home ownership. If you have not read this book, this is a powerful book. This is one to get. I know you all heard of Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law. Great book. I was on the panel with Richard. This one here, it's powerful. Powerful. So I'm recommending certain books so they can know that. Because it talks about how federal policy and home ownership happen. No, before, before the Great Depression, um, how did you buy a house? Anybody remember how, how home ones, it gets, it gets, it just gets back to we're all living in affordable housing. Do you know how you bought a home before the Depression? Anybody? Yeah, who said that? Absolutely. You pay cash for it. During the Depression, nobody had any money, right? The New Deal. Roosevelt, was the new deal that created the white middle class. The banks, the government decided to back the mortgages. That's why you all live in affordable housing. But one caveat, wasn't for blacks, wasn't for Latinos, right? We created a caste system in this country, intentionally, right? So when people talk about how great Roosevelt was, great for who? Right? Go back. First it was moving slow, now it's moving real fast. Ibram X. Kennedy, amazing book. I love this guy. I'm biased, he's a Temple alum, so am I. So. <laughs> Think about this for a moment. About 75% of resi residential land in the United States cities is zoned exclusively for single-family homes. Exclusionary zoning has significantly impact who has access to opportunities. So how did exclusionary zoning come about? Well, after Reconstruction, after all the violence that happened, after racist policies was outlawed, municipalities got together, folks got together and said, okay, we'll figure out a way to get around it will zone for single-family homes. That way, folks 
from middle income, at, at this time, low income, could not afford to buy a house in our community. We'll keep it for the class, the people that we created it for. Again, up and nobody had money during the, during the Great Depression except for the super wealthy. <laughs> kind of reminds me of the day. But anyway, <laughs> so when we orchestrated and created the middle class, we wanted to make sure to exclude folks once these laws were passed to make sure they don't have access to opportunity. And when we talk about access to opportunity, it's important to understand when we talk about integration, as Dr. King said, we're not just talking about rubbing the elbows, like just, you know, it's nice. And he said, again, toward the end of his life, it makes no difference to integrate lunch counters when I don't have money to actually sit down and buy something out of there. So exclusion, exclusionary zoning creates, creates barriers for opportunities for black folks to, to generate wealth to build through their property values, right? To send their kids to college. Because when you first bought your home, let's say you paid $100,000 of your home, 20 years later it's worth $400,000, $500,000. That is property, that is, that, is, that is economic growth. Blacks were robbed of that opportunity, right? All in the, in the sense of, we've earned it, we worked hard. Not thinking about the policies that help you get there. Policy, policy, policy. So the road to Mount Laurel. Coming out of the civil rights movement, there was this black woman named Ethel Lawrence and a black community living in Mount Laurel at that time. That was a, it was a rural area. I don't know if anybody knows about New Jersey. Mount Laurel is a very uh, well-to-do community. But at that time, it was, it was just a rural area where they were zoning single-family units. Ethel Lawrence petitioned to build multifamily units. They had this great meeting. It's ironic, we just had a presentation in Jacob's Chapel, AME Church in Mount Laurel. And the mayor told the Ethel Lawrence and the black church, black community there, underground railroad site, if you people can't afford to live on our town, you just have to leave. Now, her family had been in that town before his family was in there. Ethel Lawrence contacted an attorney named Peter O'Connor, who was one of our founders. They got together, Southern Burlington County NAACP, uh, Latino community, and they took this to court to go all the way up to the New Jersey Supreme Court. And the New Jersey Supreme Court said, every municipality must zone for the region's affordable housing needs. That became Mount Laurel One. Mount Laurel Two happened because Mount Laurel, no one paid attention to the legislation. <laughs> they refused to do it. Mount Laurel Three, the Democratic legislator compromised and created a system, a state agency called COA, Council on Affordable Housing, which has been used to manipulate, to stall and delay the production of affordable housing, right? And the reason why I have this gentleman up here, because <laughs> he used his power as governor. Do you realize that New Jersey governor is the most powerful governor in the country? Has all type of abilities all type of powers. New Jersey governor has more power than any other governor in the country. He used that power to try to dismantle the Mount Laurel Doctrine. Executive orders, had the council not even meet. Eventually, Mount Laurel 4 happened. 2015, New Jersey Supreme Court said, COA is morbid. We're going to take it back over in the courts. Every town must meet their obligation for the 10 years that they didn't, you're obligated to meet that obligation. So from 2015 up until now, we entered into, we had 350 towns we were in litigation with, <laughs> a small law firm like us, right? public interest law firm and policy law firm. 350 towns we were in litigation with. To the day, we have settled with all 350 towns, well, 349 except for one, someone's always fighting. It, because New Jersey is one of the wealthiest states in the nation. You guys do, did you know that? One of the wealthiest states in the nation, New Jersey. The racial disparity in New Jersey between those that have and have nots is astounding. All because of housing. 
But let me tell you about the economic benefit of affordable housing, right? When COVID hit, because we were in settlement agreements, because towns were deciding to follow the rules, to follow the Constitution of New Jersey and the Fair Housing Act, because we were telling them, forcing them to do litigation, right? Because they decided, okay, we're gonna stop fighting, we're gonna do this. New Jersey, when all other states were shutting down, New Jersey was still building. The economic engine of supply and demand is just simple math, right? Now, we're far behind on the number of units that we need in terms of workforce housing, affordable housing, probably over 200,000 units because of years of delay, stall, and delay tactics, right? Become, because of nimbyism, right? Not in my backyard. We're not building affordable housing. All those, when you, start, when you underproduce affordable housing, you make market rate housing go sky high. You wonder why housing is so expensive? Because we've underproduced housing for those who need it most. Seniors, those with special needs, veterans, right? First time home buyers, right? Teachers, right? Firefighters, right? Restaurant workers, service workers, the Uber drivers, the Lyft drivers. When we don't have enough housing for them, it's supply and demand. The demand for that housing, the house that you wanted to buy for $200,000 is now $400,000 because there's not enough supply. Does that make sense? When you don't produce enough affordable housing, it makes market rate housing go sky high. Evidence is clear. So I'm gonna wrap up in a minute. One of the things that we do, we organize, we do community, community organizing all the time. All right, let's see if we get this. The results of since 2015, statewide, 20, over 21,000 new deed restricted housing is put up. 81% of all multifamily development that happened with, because of the Mount Lord Doctrine. At, coming out of COVID, New Jersey had a $6 billion surplus. All the Delaware officials here. <laughs> coming out of COVID, New Jersey had a $6 billion surplus because we were building affordable housing when all the other states had slowed down. We couldn't keep up with the demand, and we're still not, we haven't kept up with the demand. We're so far behind. But what happened, that economic engine of growth sustained the state so it had a surplus, right? Let me try this one more time. It'll get there. There you go, let me go back. This is some of the projects that were going on in Hopewell. Partnership with Homefront. This is 26 permanent supportive housing. So this is a, another, you know, when we talk about affordable housing, people just think it's just for low-income people. Let's be honest, they think it's just for low-income black people, right? <laughs> that, let's, let's be real, right? And what they don't realize when you're stopping affordable housing, you're stopping housing for supportive, supportive housing, you're stopping housing for seniors, you're stopping housing for veterans. This is what you're fighting against, right? This is a great development. Homefront does great work around, you know, when special needs children become adults, they need a place to live. And the things that we hear when we talk about this type of work, it's disgusting. The depravity of us sometimes as a society is just sickening. The way we do seniors in this country is sickening. Think about what we do. Particularly seniors are, who wants to, who try to pass their particular the home that they paid off all their lives, pass it down to their children, right? And because they have to, they need care and have to go in a nursing home, you no longer can pass that asset. The state takes it from you. How ironic is that? You pay taxes all these years? Think about it for a moment. 
pay taxes all these years, and they say, you know what? Because you have an asset, you need to cover the cost of your care. Well, I thought I was paying my damn taxes all these years. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. They take your asset. Do you guys know? Am I speaking foreign language here? You guys are all aware of that, right? This is how some middle class blacks can't pass down wealth because it's stripped from them, right? I, I, I got to close. So this is how we use our legal strategy, right? We deal, we deal with federal housing work too. We do advocacy for development. We address historical barriers of economic disparities. We work with uh, the, the eliminate access for, for these barriers, because one of the things, and, I'll, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to stop it because there's a lot going on. Superstorm Sandy hit New Jersey. You guys remember that years ago when that guy that I showed earlier was going running for president? <laughs> and he was, oh my goodness, he thought he was going to be big stuff. He was screwing up Sandy big time. We sued the state. We settled the, the largest HUD settlement in the history of HUD, over almost $800 million, because this guy, when folks were trying to get money to get their housing repair, they didn't have Spanish-speaking languages on there, they didn't have access for the proper uh, forms to go on there, they had denied cases. And in Atlantic County, they just outright denied 80% of the cases in Atlantic County, just because they, they, they were doing whatever they wanted to do. And we stopped them, made them go back and redo all of it. So we, we don't just require towns to do what they need to do, but we also work on the issues of safeguarding housing. No one should be de denied uh, housing solely based upon their credit, past eviction filings, and criminal legal uh, eviction filings. So it, when we talk about these issues of credit, it's a, a tool to use to discriminate. When we talk about evictions, do you know, do you know when you get, when a landlord files an eviction notice on you, you can go to court and win. The landlord was illegally evicting you. You win your case, but guess what? That eviction stays on your record. Stays on your record. So we're trying to pass legislation in Jersey to, to get that taken care of. <laughs> this is the Fair Chance and Housing Act that we got passed. You'll see me in the back here I'm standing behind the governor. And I was yelling at him the whole time, doing this piece of legislation. I need you to be LBJ. Stand up and fight for this bill, Governor. Stand up and fight for this bill. This limits the use of criminal background checks, because landowners are using background checks going 20 years back to make sure folks didn't have access to housing. New Jersey have the strongest, the strongest statewide law in the country that limit the use of criminal background checks. It's one thing to get housing built. It's another thing that makes sure people have access to it. That's why we believe in racial, economic, and social integration. No matter what law you develop in Delaware, you have to go to the next step. You get the housing built, they will find a way to make sure black and brown folks don't get access to it. So not only did we get the Fair Chance and Housing Act passed, we made sure there was a budgetary item in the bill to staff up the Department of the Division of Civil Rights to make sure they can staff it up and fund to do the enforcement of it. Don't ever forget that. Just getting the piece of legislation passed is only the first step. If it's not a budgetary item, nothing will get done. You hear me? They said, well, we have civil rights bill all day, every day, all along. We just won't fund it. <laughs> there, are you, are you here? This is how this works, right? Oh, you want black mayors in the city and all? Oh, we'll give you black mayors and cut your funding. Oh, we'll do the Great Society Initiative, right? And don't fund it. This is how this works. Passing legislation is the first step. The next step is make sure it's funded and make sure it's enforced. Got it? Can I get an amen? Can I get a show no? Thank you, baby. Thank you. That's my wife right there. Where do we go from here? Future in housing justice space in New Jersey. Questions and answers. Well, we'll I, oh, I'm sorry. We'll have um, my good friend Sonia come up and talk. Okay. We'll do Q&A after this, correct? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
you've really given us a lot to think about. Um, some profound thoughts. Zoning, pushing people out of the very homes, property, country that they've fought for in, in every war. Um, preventing inherited equity. Um, underproducing affordable housing, but you left us with some hope and encouragement to forbid um, or to welcome housing, but forbid that segregation is ever going to be a part of that, for that to be our goal. So for that, we thank you. Um, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Rabbi Sonia Starr. Um, not only is she the organizer of the Faith and Housing Justice Weekend, uh, she's the policy director for the Housing Alliance Delaware, a statewide nonprofit organization that works uh, with partners to address the affordable housing needs in our communities and solve the crisis of homelessness in Delaware. Social justice has been our primary mission for the past two decades as a rabbi of a progressive congregation, as a volunteer, and currently in the position of the policy director of the Housing Alliance. Sonia continues to consult and teach about diversity, equality, and includes both a secular and Jewish point of view. Sonia works tirelessly to help us all understand the importance of our voice and how we can make a difference as advocates for our neighbors. So, as she gives us a local perspective, please help me in giving a warm welcome to Rabbi Sonia Starr. You are right, Reverend. Somebody gives that bio and you look around and say, who is supposed to be coming up now? <laughs> um, it's been a privilege to work at the Housing Alliance of Delaware for about two years now. It'll be two years in March. And I've learned so much. And there are professionals in this field who've been working in, tirelessly in Delaware on affordable housing issues in this room a lot longer than that. So I might turn to a couple of you if I need some help with some of the facts. And I'm sure you will set me straight if I get some of them wrong. The two pieces, as you were talking, that I picked up on that Delaware needs to confront going forward is the, affordable, the lack of funding for affordable housing and the nimbyism, not in my backyard, the exclusionary zoning that is alive and well within the state of Delaware. If we could broach those two things, there'll be plenty of other work to do. Don't get me wrong but we will be way along the path. So where exactly is Delaware? Some of you know the Delaware State Housing Authority needs, a th needs um, assessment just came out. And some of the new stats that came out are that we are 20,000 20, units, not people, 20,000 units short for low income folks, right? We're behind 20,000 units. In order to stay exactly the same to keep up with the population growth, we need to build or produce 1,200 new units every single year. Currently, we build less than 500 units a year. We are forecasted to increase our deficit of, in of affordable housing for low-income folk, right? And just to put it in perspective, if you make 100% area medium income, AMI, there is 101 units. There is a surplus of units for every 100 households. So we have decided in Delaware that those people with discretionary funding deserve to have housing. And those people who don't, don't, because we've made an economic choice. Inclusionary zoning in Delaware is hyper-local, just like most places in the country. And as you already heard, that was created to segregate our state and our country and has continued to do so. It was effective. It worked, right? The goal was to segregate us. It did exactly that. It segregated us. 
In Delaware, we focus on three counties, right? But the three counties are only responsible for unincorporated land, right? That's it. They are not responsible. Newcastle is not responsible for Wilmington. Kent is not responsible for Dover, right? They are only responsible for the unincorporated land. There are 57 municipalities in the state of Delaware, right? And if you want to effectively right now deal with zoning in Delaware, you have to go and you have to be a presence in every single one of them. Every single one of them. There is a comprehensive plan that they have to propose to the governor that gets signed by the governor every 10 years and gets reviewed every five years. And most of them have something about how they're going to increase their affordable housing. But when they don't, there's no consequence, right? So there's a comprehensive plan that has great hopes, but there is no consequence for not doing it. So I could write anything in my plan if I know nobody's going to do anything to keep me to it, mm -hmm. right? We allow that to be part of how our state does business. Currently, though, there are some important things happening that you should know about because your advocacy is going to be necessary in order to get them passed. On the state level, there are some conversations about the need for either carrots or sticks, depending where you are in the carrot stick argument, to encourage local municipalities to produce more affordable and safe housing. They're conversations. They need to be moved into legislation. And I would argue, this is just Sonia speaking, what do I know? I would argue they need to be sticks because carrots haven't been working, right? They need to be required. Do you know that there's only four municipalities, maybe five, but I think it's four that have enough affordable and safe housing, not enough to meet the demand of the state, but enough that they are oversaturated in their municipality. Every other municipality, right, that's 53 other municipalities, have zero to five percent. I think one has seven, right? Only four have more than 10 percent. 10 percent is about where the tipping point is supposed to be, I've been told, to have affordable housing that doesn't change the things that we all care about, our property value. So if we all had 10 percent affordable and safe housing in every 57 municipalities, we'd be going a long way to be solving our affordable housing production problem. In Newcastle, there's a proposal to make some changes to land use policy, which will help create more affordable housing. And in Newark, there's currently a listening campaign going on to hear from residents if they should be able to provide more affordable and safe, safe housing for those who make less than 80% AMI. In 2022, Sussex County government updated an ordinance originally passed in, 20, in 2008 to incentivize affordable rental units. And Sussex Housing Group advocates have been working every single zoning board for the county this year to appear to make sure that that's not enough, that they need to be doing more. But nobody can go and do all of this alone. You know, you heard a little bit of the history, just a touch of it, right? This is not a COVID mess that we got ourselves into. It's been going on for decades and decades and decades, long before it was in the newspaper. It actually reminds me of the opioid crisis, right? It was a war on drugs, war against drugs when it was black and brown people mostly who were being arrested for drugs. But all of a sudden, when white people were having prescription problems with their opioid crisis, we had a treatment problem. There has been a crisis in Delaware and across this country about affordable housing for decades that has applied primarily to black and brown folk. But now that lower middle class white folk are being affected, we have an affordable housing crisis. And it didn't just happen. It wasn't any one person that did it. It had nothing to do with COVID. And it's going to take every single one of us to get ourselves out of it. And so that's what Housing Alliance is here for. There's tons of flyers outside after the program. I'll stay as late as you want to talk to me. We need your help because not one of us can do it alone. Thank you.
Should I stay here? Just, or you want me to come down? What do you want? Only because the steps are hard for me, so tell me where you want me. Okay. You're going to come up, though, because mm -hmm. you really want to hear from him. He's an expert. <laughs> so, questions, please. If you uh, eliminate exclusionary zoning and rezone to allow multifamily units, how much, if any, affordable housing will the market be able to produce without government subsidies? And how much government subsidy do you need to, you need to complete the job? Right. So I can't give you a dollar amount. Okay, I'll be real. I, can't, I don't have that. I can tell you that you cannot build subsidized housing with the cost of land, lumber, construction, right, without subsidies. It's just, it's, it is economically not feasible. So that's why we believe that we need a designated line item in the budget where the government, Delaware State, is saying that we promise that every single year we are going to be putting X million, and X million needs to be much more than four, four, much more than four, which is what it's been until the 30 million we got for ARPA. And by the way, I just found out all the ARPA funds are spoken for. It's already gone. So we need to have a designated line item in our budget saying we're making a commitment to producing our way out of this. And, and I would just add, when it comes Please. to subsidies, federal government and the local and state government, you know, this, this question about subsidies and the, and the word subsidy itself um, really doesn't allow us to have a real conversation. Think about this for a moment, and Matt Desmond said this in his book, How to Be um, Poverty by America. COVID-19 hit, right? The country shut down. Mm -hmm. Nobody was working. Nobody was producing business. business nobody was earning the income the poverty rate did not increase. Think about that for a moment. Why didn't the poverty rate increase when nobody was working? Because guess what? what? Government did what government's supposed mm -hmm. to do, take care of its people. I don't care how much it costs to produce more affordable housing with subsidies. That's not the question. Is there a need for more affordable housing? the government should step in just like it stepped in the COVID-19 and made sure none of us went under. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Long answer, sorry. No, yeah. you're good. And, and on the point of subsidies, on the point of subsidies, I would like for us to, and I'm not sure that you were here during the, uh, the initial discussion around subsidies. Uh, it's how we use the word and what the word means. And so a lot of, um, well, first of all, if we go back to the origins of these lands, okay, these lands were stolen, okay, so the, all, everything that is built on these lands is subsidized, okay? For, let's, start, let's start there, okay? So everything is subsidized. And from there, we had land grants, we had homesteading, we had all kind of subsidies that applied only to those individuals that were classified white. And if we go back again to the founding of this country, there were no white people and people of African descent and people of European descent, some of them came here on equal footing. Okay, so some black, black people were free and some white folks were indentured. So we came here similarly situated. And then we move forward and we look at, and I'm a veteran, and so we just celebrated Veterans Day. First, the GI Bill, which undergirded white land ownership and homeship, homeownership, benefited white veterans and excluded veterans of African descent. And so when we talk about subsidies, we have to be conscious of how we're using the word and what it implies. Also, all housing is subsidized. Whether or not it's people who are of lower income occupying them, 
or not, and I think you referenced Matt Desmond, mm -hmm. one of the points that he makes about housing is, and I think you alluded to it earlier, if you are a homeowner, your home ownership is subsidized every year when you file your income taxes. You get a subsidy back for paying your mortgage. So all housing is subsidized. And if we want to talk about subsidies, it's again how we look at subsidizing private industry. We don't talk about the subsidies that private industry gets. We only look at subsidies as being negative when people who are of African descent or who are brown and poor get a little help. Okay, then we want to talk about how bad subsidies are. They, okay? Mm -hmm. let, let me just say, I, to me, the word subsidy isn't a dirty word. Mm -hmm. Right. In right. fact, every economic activity that occurs in this country is subsidized right. in some yeah. way mm -hmm. or right. another. Mm -hmm. So I didn't mean right. no, no, to no, use no, the word the we got in a mm -hmm. negative sense. Right. Let me ask you all a question. How many people like to go out to eat occasionally? How many people like to go to a restaurant? Anybody here like to still go to the movie theater? Anybody like to go to a nightclub occasionally and listen to some music? Anybody? The needs assessment just said 48% of everybody in the hospitality, entertainment business is either cost or severely cost burden in the state of debt. 48% of those people, we like enjoying all their work. We like doing all the things that they make happen for us don't make enough to pay for their house, their energy bills, medicine, food, school supplies. Mm -hmm. Because we get to benefit for their low wages, mm -hmm. right? It is all a systematic attempt to control who gets and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. I, I like it, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna shut up after this. I believe in government. The, the, the goal of those folks who are at the 1% and those who want to control, create a, a, um, a, a system of dictatorship is to get us not to believe in government. Right. That's the goal. Right. Government works right. when we make it work. Right. We all needed government in COVID-19, mm -hmm. and it delivered. We have to require the same thing when it comes to everyday living when we need more affordable housing. We have to pass legislation that requires town to zone for affordable housing. We have to put money in the budget to make sure it happened. We have to make sure that what we did in New Jersey is, is any statewide land, land that's owned by the state, whenever it's sold for housing, that portion of it, 20% has to be affordable. Hmm. We, we, have to, we have to believe in government and hold government accountable. That's the key. I believe in government. My ancestors died for it. So did yours. Don't fall for the, the nonsense that, you know, Republican, Democrat, it's all nonsense. Hold government accountable. We believe in government. We need it. We need it to work more efficient and more effectively. That's how we can produce more housing in this country. Good evening. Um, I was wondering if, I know we have, you know, the affordable housing shortage, and I know if we focus on some of the multifamily plans, we can catch up faster. But is there a concern about um, the percentage of renters in the area? Is there a way to overpopulate in multifamily where we are still um, not addressing the wealth gap in home ownership and building assets? So in, in terms of, and this is why I think Try to, a Dorothy A. Brown's book, The Whiteness of Wealth. And, and in that book, she tells you why home ownership haven't produced prop, um, uh, wealth for black folks. Um, one of the reasons is we're always buying in areas that are depreciating. We're being stere mm -hmm. redlining and racial stereotypes still is going on. And one of the other reasons is when we get first time home ownership, you know, these houses that sometimes we're, our first time homeowners fall victim of, you know, you can make a nice, you can, you can make a, a real crappy house look brand new with paint and some tile, and the, and the bones of the house are falling apart. The sewer lines are falling, you can't see none of that stuff. So a first time homeowner, you know, save up their money, particularly black and brown folks, move into this house, and within a year, the heater's gone, the plumbing's gone, and they don't have the resources to fix it up. And the house goes into foreclosure. And guess who loves when the house goes into foreclosure? The banks. 
<laughs> right? So it, it repro you know, so one of the things that is healthy about rentership, and I'm not saying this is the answer to everything, rentership in a nice area, rentership in the area where mm -hmm. the, 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 there are higher opportunities, give them opportunities to go to get better education, better jobs. So this gives them the opportunity to move into a home ownership, increase their, their income. It, it's not the only solution, but we have to be careful. We've had homeowners, first time home buyers programs. What we just did in New Jersey, we passed legislation, first generation home ownership. Mm -hmm. So you, your family never owned a home, you never owned a home, and we're putting money in the budget, we put money in the budget for first generation and making sure they're buying in areas that are appreciating and not depreciating. This is the trick about housing, right? It is location, location, location. Too many black and brown folks have been duped by really these lenders and banks that really preyed on folks, got them to buy their first house, it looks nice, but it's falling apart. The bones are falling apart. And this is, and we wonder why, you know, some of our communities are dilapidated because they spent all their money getting in the house. The heater's gone. I remember the first time I moved in the suburbs, <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure after this, um, my, with my wife and kid, my dad helped me put money down to get the house. Within two years, the heater was gone, had to, and I yelled at my dad, why'd you make me buy a house? Why did you let me buy a house, man? I survived it because I had family support. But if anybody ever owned a home, the upkeep and the maintenance of a home is a killer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And imagine someone who, first time home buyer, moving to the house within five years, if everything's not brand new, it could be a problem. Add to it the credit cards that you get coming to the door, oh, yeah. and you start doing some credit card damage, you're in the hole before you know it. It's not a one, this is the, the hardest thing about affordable housing is it's not a one solution fits all, right? We need generational wealth to be passed on to our black and brown brothers and sisters. So that's home ownership by and large. But we also need more rentals because they're better than being on the streets, right? And not everybody wants to be dealing with the new electric heater and the new roof and all the other stuff that comes with home ownership. They still have a right to have affordable housing, right? We also have land, a land bank. Actually, I think we have two in Delaware, right? A land bank is a hybrid. It means that you rent the land and you own the house. Right? It only, it's income based, so it's only for affordable housing. It's a way to start to build that generational wealth. And then when you sell it, it has to stay affordable, right? But you get to take the money that you put into the house and you could put it into whatever you want it to. So there's a whole lot of solutions out there. I mean, there's even some simple solutions going back to inclusionary zoning. Did you know that in Newark, it is illegal if you're not family to live together. Now, I don't know about you all, but I got through college by living with at least three other, if not four other people in my place, right? So we could split the cost, right? But that's illegal in Newark. That's a zoning issue. We could change that, right, if we so choose. Yeah, there's many creative ways to do, like renting is just one, but there's co-ops, there's, mm -hmm. there's okay. all, so, you know, when we think about these laws, we have to be very creative. And some towns are, in, in New Jersey, and sometimes I'm quite sure in Delaware can be too. We have to be very creative. We all are creative beings, right? We all have ideas and ways to, that's the creator created us with creativity, right? Think about that for a moment, right? The creator created us with creativity. We have to find ways to make sure it works for all of us and not just for some of us. Other questions? Sue has a question. This is for Sonia. Um, what is your advice for the concerned citizens here, um, for Delaware, for action items, for advocacy, for anything else that we can do to make a difference? So there's a table outside of all kinds of things, but there's one flyer I want you to really take up. It's the one that says, Faith in Housing Justice Next Steps. There's eight of them on there. There could have been a hundred, but I wanted to get on one side of a paper. The bottom one says, contact me with any other ideas. That's the you know, catch-all. Pick one that you'll do as an individual. 
And then I'm going to ask Westminster to pick one you're willing to do as a community, right? Pick something, anything, pick something, get involved and be part of the solution. Hi, I, I just wanted to thank um, Westminster Presbyterian for offering this event. I live around the corner and um, it's just really great to be able to come out and learn about this really important subject. Um, and also the Housing Alliance and thank you for, you know, just bring this topic forward to the community. And I wanted to ask a question to uh, Reverend Dobson about how you, in New Jersey, with a zoning strategy where you permit, you know, more multifamily residential housing, how do you make sure that that housing is affordable? Like, mm -hmm. how do you balance that kind of, those market pressures to always build for the higher end and then the, um, the where the need is for affordable housing? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, something we battle every day. So in New Jersey, you have the, you know, the area median income. So New Jersey affordable housing law goes 100%, 80%, and all the way down to the 30%. Mm -hmm. So we go all the way down to 30% area median income. And you know, now my advice to Delaware, like we're an advocacy group. We're a watchdog group. And our founder knew that he was fighting this fight. But if he didn't have someone you know, continue on doing that, then all, it, it wouldn't happen. So I, I was, one of the things that we do, we, we're, we're a public interest law firm that works on policy, advocacy. Once you pass legis, legis, you know, litigation, or once you pass legislation, somebody has to be the watchdog, and somebody mm -hmm. has to be making sure the municipalities are doing what they're doing, uh, doing the right thing, because every day is a fight, every day. It, it is not something that you sit down and Oh, we got a bill passed. Mm -hmm. New Jersey has affordable housing obligation. As you see, 10 years, it was inactive. Mm -hmm. You know, the first, the Mount Laurel won, towns did nothing. So if you don't have an advocacy group, advocacy group a civil rights group, faith institutions, making sure towns are doing that. And so what we do, we partner with local NAACP, we par partner with the local branches, to say, because everything's local. Mm -hmm. What's happening in this town? Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? And we get reports they're not. And we, you know, hey, um, we've been doing this for, for so long now, but they, they know, oh my goodness, Fairshire Housing Center, <laughs> you know, we built this reputation. They hate us, but, but they you, get have it done. To, you have to be diligent. You have, mm -hmm. I, I, listen, I make no bones about this. This is not easy work. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is on the ground fighting every day. But if you want progress, if you want America to live up to what it should live up to, if you want the government to work efficiently and effectively, we have to hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. We have to. And so, Reverend Dobson, can you speak to a, um, an example in New Jersey where after you know, pushing back against the NIMBYism and you were able to hold them accountable and they have now built that housing that was so needed, how do people feel about it now? after that new housing has been built that they were fighting so, so much against, mm -hmm. are they like, wow, okay, this, it, this isn't so bad? Like, how have they reacted now? I, I would, I'm, I'm gonna be totally honest with you, not like I was gonna lie, but it varies. Mm -hmm. um, there are some towns who still hate us, um, but there are some folks who appreciate that it's happening in town. There are some towns that, who will fight. You know, one town we fought for 40 years, they didn't care. They just were gonna fight and fight and fight. In Mount Laurel itself, we saw several years ago, for the first time they elected their first black mayor. Hmm. Um, Doug Massey did a book called Climbing Mount Laurel, when of course all the things, when the Mount Laurel, Ethel Lawrence development was first built, they said the property value's gonna go, out, go up, go down, crime's gonna go up, all these things that they said. He went back 40 years later and said, let's see what happened. Many of the people in the town didn't even know the development existed. <laughs> They were, they were shocked because it's a beautiful development. It looks like a golf course. It looks like every other you know, affordable unit of uh, uh, housing market. development mm -hmm. around Mount Laurel. And that's the key. The developers, when you're talking about building affordable housing, make sure it's a good developer. Because mm -hmm. there's some crappy affordable housing developments that I've seen. I'm, I'm just being honest. Make sure it looks like the other houses in the town. And then when you do that, people was like, they were shocked. Oh, my God. That's affordable housing? I didn't even know. So it varies from town to town. Some people appreciate it, and some people still don't like it, and they go kicking and screaming. Um, that's, that's the reality. Thank you. 
We're already 13 minutes over. Does anyone else have a last dying question before we wrap this up? What was the protective housing unit in, in that collection? Was it, um, you said something about protective. Say, answer, ask that again. For you, you, in one of the lists of things you had a thing, the 25% protective housing in the group, was it? Oh, that was the supportive housing. What make, is that? Make what is that? Permanent, so what is support, permanent support? Supportive housing? housing? Yeah. yeah. So those, those with special needs, um, those who, who um, the folks with special needs that, uh, you know, that are, that are, you know, have supportive services in that development, um, there, there are, you know, mental challenges, like all, all the things around special needs housing. New Jersey does a good job, particularly home front, of capitalizing on Mount Laurel's doctrine to say, okay, we want to make sure we have special needs housing for, for those who are, um, you know, ex experiencing those type of things and making sure they had the services as well. Permanent supportive housing means that you get housing and the wraparound services that you need come to you, mm -hmm. right? The idea is that in a, if I need a chiro, you know, somebody to work on my knee, I need to go out, right, and go find somebody and make sure my insurance covers it and all the rest, right? The idea of permanent supportive housing is that person comes to you, right, so that they get all of those wraparounds. When they need more wraparounds, they intensify. When they don't need it, if they get healthier, they don't have to move, but the services back and rescind, and therefore they can have more, um, less services, but stay in the same home. Delaware does not have an extensive permanent supportive housing system, and it's something we ba badly, badly need. Thank you, everyone, for coming here this evening. Um, before we Thank do you. a final round of applause for our speakers, I want to also, okay. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge we have a couple folks here from the Homes Campaign. If you want to know more about other advocacy work that's being done locally, please put your hands up. Homes Campaign. Thank you. And finally, here we have Senator Rux Huxtable, who came up from Sussex County. He has been a champion of affordable housing for 20 years before becoming a senator, and we're so glad you came to join us this evening. Thank you.